Jimi Hendrix, you guys. Well, good morning. Little Rock. Um, let me uh, begin by just welcoming our visitors this morning, those of you who are here for the first time. Man, you are welcome, and thank you for blessing us with your presence this morning. We count it a privilege. You know, here in the Bible Belt, um, you know, there are like 1,000 churches in every city. And so you got plenty of places to go, but this morning you chose this place, and we, and we, we don't count that like, oh, whatever, you're just here. So welcome. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here. Uh, and yes, uh, um, my family's been going through um, some difficult times in the last couple of months, really. Um, last Tuesday, we laid my father-in-law to rest, and, um, and he was the one that was well. And so my mother-in-law remains in the ICU this morning. Um, and so we're just asking that you pray that we get just about a, a month so we can catch our breath from putting dad in the ground before we got to go back and do that for Carla's mother. So we had to put her on a plane yesterday again just so she can be with her mom when they readmitted her to the ICU. So it's a tough time, but God is good. Even in the midst of it all, he is good. Amen? Amen. Well, what? If you are visiting with us, uh, we are in a series. It's through the book of John, the Gospel of John. And um, I have the privilege of hopefully finishing up chapter one to this morning. And so let's pray and, uh, and, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak this morning. Um, as I open my lips, I want his voice to be heard and not mine. And so let's pray and ask him to teach us this morning. Can we? Will you join me in prayer? Father, I'm a mess, um, but your word is perfect. And so as this imperfect vessel desires to preach a perfect word, I pray that your spirit would do so. And God, that you would use my voice, that you would use my culture, that you would use my life experiences, that you would use my study, that you would use whatever you desire to use this morning to communicate your perfect word. And Lord, I pray for the listeners beginning with me. God, that we would leave this place not just having heard an encouraging message, but God, we would leave this place changed and ready to make change in our culture. God, thank you for this opportunity. It's always a privilege to be able to teach. And so, Holy Spirit, do your thing, Jesus. And when it's all said and done, we'll give you glory. For we do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all of his people said, amen, 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 amen. Well, the year was 1977. It was 11 years old. And that was the year that I remember fondly because that was the year that I got my first chemistry set. Y'all remember chemistry sets? Anybody? Maybe 40 and older. They don't let kids play with chemistry sets anymore because all of these, all of these uh, lawyers and stuff, they'll be all they'll be making a lot of money. But back in the day, we got chemistry sets. And so I got my first chemistry set, and so I was elated. Now, the dogs and the cats and the crickets and the grasshoppers, the ants, they weren't all that happy when Anthony got his chemistry set. <laughs> I'm just playing about the dogs and cats. I know, I know some of y'all are like, wait a minute. Jen, I'm just playing. <laughs> there was that one cat, though. Yeah, let's, let's move on. So I got this chemistry set, man, and I had my test tubes, my test tube holders. I had my little microphone, I mean, my little uh, uh, microscopic, mi microscope. I had all of my chemicals lined up. I was ready to blow some stuff up. And so um, I loved the chemistry set because I was, very, I was always inquisitive. I always wanted to know how things worked, whether that was a thing or whether that was 
uh, a living organism. And so, yes, I did from time to time run outside and grab myself a grasshopper or two and went to dissecting because I wanted to get into how this thing worked. And uh, I remember one time, this has nothing to do with the message, but it just came to mind. <laughs> I remember one time I had in mind that I was going to develop the first non-combustible material, like for firefighters. Like, so when they went in, they wouldn't get you know, burned up. So I was in my chemistry lab downstairs in the basement, and I had put together some chemicals, mixed them up real good and added some water, and it was a little bit of smoke coming off of the thing, but that was good, that, that, was, that was what I wanted. So I went and got a paper towel, because that was my first thing. You know, I didn't want to run right to the cotton, so I just went to a paper towel. And I dipped the paper towel in the substance that I had created. And immediately when I pulled it out, I got myself a match. Now don't tell my dad that I had matches in the house, but I had some matches. And I struck this match and put it up to the thing, and it didn't burn. I said, I've done it, <laughs> created the non-combustible substance, whatever it was, until the material dried up. <laughs> and I tried it one more time, and the thing just went up in smoke. I was like, oh, it was because it was wet that it didn't. <laughs> that was my chemistry experiment. And I was doing stuff like that all the time, because I always wanted to get to the core of how something worked, why it worked the way it worked, what made it tick. And as I started studying this passage this morning, I, I felt the same way about this whole issue of discipleship. I wanted to know how it works. Like, and, and as I read through the narrative that John walks us through in the final 32 verses of this chapter, really what he's giving us is the DNA of discipleship. What's at the core of this this, this, really this mentoring thing that we've kind of called discipleship. The biblical term that we use is discipleship, but it's really mentoring. That's all it is. And so what I thought we'd do this morning is I, as we looked at these last 32 verses, I wanted to kind of, I'm going to go back a little bit uh, into what Chuck dealt, dealt with last week because it was so good. Um, but what I want to do this morning is I want us to read through these passages and, and, and learn from two of the greatest disciple makers ever. So I want to learn some things from John the Baptist as it relates to the core of discipleship, and then I want to go to Jesus and learn some things from him. Y'all want to go with me? Yeah. All right, so if we start in the book of John, chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 19, and we're going to answer the question, what does the DNA of discipleship really look like? And as we jump into this passage, I want to first learn from John the Baptist. And the scripture says, now this was John's testimony, verse 19. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Stop right there. Now, if... if if we're going to be good disciples, which we should be, the Bible says that we are not just to make converts, but Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he said, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, indicating a relationship with him, an identification with Jesus, but then teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. So this issue of discipleship is a very important issue. It was so important that it was the last thing that Jesus had said before he ascended to heaven. So what do we do with that? Well, first, if we're going to be in a discipleship relationship, we must first understand who we are and who we are not. John puts it very well here. This is John the Baptist that I'm talking about. It says in verse 20, he did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. Now, when you're in a discipleship relationship, a mentoring relationship, the very first thing that you must understand is you are not the Christ. And the very first thing that you must tell the person that you're discipling is, I am not him. 
Listen, in other words, don't look to me and think that you're seeing Jesus because I'm going to let you down. Because I am not perfect. Because I am a flawed individual just like you. The only difference between you and I is I've been walking this road just a little bit longer than you, and so I've learned some things, primarily that I am not the Christ. How many of y'all were on fire when you first came to know Christ? You were, on, you were out there, you were telling everybody about Jesus. But how many of y'all ran some folk away at the same time? Right? Because you hadn't lived enough. You were just saved. You were on fire. You stopped clubbing and you stopped drinking and you stopped sexing and you stopped all of that stuff. So you, was, you, were the, you, were, you really thought you were the Christ. And then you started going after other people. And what you, what you, when you went after them, you were more pharisaical in the way you approached them than you would be now after having some failures in your life. Now you can come to them and say, you know what, man? I'm not the Christ. I'm not the man. But John knew that he wasn't the Christ, but he also knew who he was. He was able to say in verse 20, I'm not, the, I'm not the Savior. I will let you down. Because as a disciple or discipler, you've got to have the same spirit of humility that John the Baptist had. We're talking discipleship, the DNA of discipleship. At its core, if I am a discipler, I have to approach this relationship in a spirit of humility. Listen, I know we're getting ready to walk together. I don't have this thing figured out, man. I've been walking it a little bit longer than you, but I'm still gonna mess up. I'm still messing up. I still have a bad attitude about different things. And, and so when we get into this thing a little later, when we talk about what we learn from Jesus, you'll understand why that's so important. But first and foremost, you must know who you are, and you also must know who you are not. So I'm not the Christ. So who are you? And this is great because this is what the Pharisees asked in verse 22. They asked him, go to verse 21. Then who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, well, then who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. I love this question. It's the greatest question ever. And it is, what do you say about yourself? I know I'm not the Christ, but who are you? And so a question for all of us, whether you're in a discipleship relationship or not, is this. What do you say about yourself? You know, a lot of us spend a lot of time in a lot of negative self-talk. Anybody ever else do that? It's part of the reason why, as a culture, we can't exist in silence anymore. Something always has to be on because when we get in, 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 when we get in a position where we are only there with ourselves, we begin to talk to ourselves. And a lot of that talk is very negative self-talk because we don't know who we are. We know who we're not. We know we're not Jesus, but some of the times we go to the opposite end and we really don't know who we are. So let me tell you this morning who you are, if you know Jesus. How many of y'all have, have accepted Christ? You know him personally. You're personally walking with him in a relationship. All right, let me tell you who you are. You are a child of God called to fulfill his purposes in the earth. Now, here's the question you've got to ask yourself. Is that enough is it enough and and what I want to tell you is as we look at the DNA of a discipleship relationship if you are a discipler then you've got to get to a place where that is enough because if you don't get to the place where that is enough I'm a child of God my identity is found in him and not in what I do or what, I'm, I've, what I've accomplished, or what I'm working on, or who I'm married to, or my, who my friends are. My identity is locked into who I am in Christ. And you've got to become okay with that. 
Because if you are not okay with that, as you begin to disciple people, then everything that you're doing with them is all about you and not about them. Because you're trying to get your identity in, in this person. It's kind of like when you were first saved and you were inviting people to Christ and they came to Christ. How many of y'all remember those notches in your belt you used to always talk about? Well, yes, you know, I led so-and-so to Christ yesterday. And really, it wasn't about Jesus. It was all about you. Because your identity was found in what you could do, not in the person that you belonged to. John knew something here. John said, I'm not the Christ, but I also know who I am. Because after they asked, well, who are you? He said, man, I'm just a voice. Like, I, I'm, I'm only a voice. I, I have purpose. I know who I am. I'm not Christ, but I'm the one that comes before him. I am the one that's pointing everybody else to him. You know, we're no different than John the Baptist. We've become believers in Jesus, not so that we can get, attain stuff. Not so I can, our loved ones can live forever because we know Jesus and we have a direct line to pray for him. So when people get sick, we just need to pray and they'll be well. Does that happen in real life? No. People die. So that can't be the reason we come to Christ. It's not because we want a great job or we want a great life even. It's because we want a relationship with Jesus. Period. We love God. So we've come to him. Now, American Christianity will tell you that you've come to him because you're going to get all of this stuff because we're so materialistic in this country. But go to a third world country where they worship God with nothing and you'll learn a little bit about just knowing Jesus. Listen, John the Baptist knew something here. He's like, man, I'm just a child of God. I'm, I'm just here because I'm the voice that's supposed to tell you when the Christ is coming. In other words, I have purpose, and I'm, I, I know what my identity is, and it is in what and who I am in Christ. If you're going to disciple somebody, you must first know who you are and who you are not. And you've got to get to a place where you can answer that question. Well, what do you say about yourself? He didn't say, well, what do you say about what you do? What do you say about who you know? What do you say about what you've accomplished, John? They said, what do you say about yourself? So that's a question for us this morning. And I love this. Verse 29, the next day, this is what John's purpose is. He saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, there he is, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I didn't know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. DNA of discipleship, the purpose for a discipler, his primary or her primary job is to point people to Christ. John says, I didn't know him, but the reason that I was doing what I was doing in life is so that I might reveal him to everybody else. And as a disciple of Jesus, and if you say you know him, then guess what? You're a disciple of Jesus. What's your purpose? Ultimately, it is to reveal Christ to a dying world. John shows us some good stuff. Here's a man who's running around in some uh, crazy looking clothes eating some crazy food, probably talked about tremendously, but he was okay with who he was. Are you okay with who you are? Because sometimes when you begin to represent Christ, you're going to get talked about. And sometimes you're going to get talked about by other Christians. Try walking in Mark Demaz's shoes for a little while. You know, this is great here at Mosaic, but everybody out there does, everybody, every Christian is not down with this issue of multi-ethnic church. And he takes hits from Christ pastors who have not yet looked into the scriptures and allowed the Holy Spirit to deal with this issue of racism in their hearts. 
And so he gets talked about. Not by people out there. They get it. <laughs> They've been doing multi-ethnic life for years. We're the irrelevant ones. But he understands his purpose. And so all of those words, whatever. So just like they probably talked about John, Mark's like, look, you know what, whatever. I know what the scripture says. I know what the biblical mandate is for the multi-ethnic church. So keep on talking. I know who I am and I know my purpose. See, when you're locked into what you have been called to do, all this other stuff makes no sense. It makes no difference. It makes no difference what people say, what people do. God has called you to something. You become a great disciple when you understand what that is. So maybe the prayer today is, God, what, what's, what's my purpose? I get what Pastor Anthony is speak, speaking about, but I never really thought through that a whole lot. What, what did you call me for? I know it's got to be more than just me going to heaven. So what's my purpose? I am a child of God. I get that, and I'm working through some of my mess to kind of really get that. But even as a child of God, what, what am I called? What's my purpose? What are the purposes that I've been called to, to fulfill in your kingdom? Because quite honestly, Lord, I don't want to be so, I don't want to be so committed to the preservation of self that I'm not committed to the proclamation of the gospel. Amen. And that happens. And, and you know when that happens? I'm, I'm so concerned about preserving self because when I'm asked a question, what do you say about yourself? It's not that good. And I don't want anybody else to know that, so I'm preserving myself rather than proclaiming the gospel message because I really don't care what anybody else thinks. Guess what? I'm jacked up. And guess what? Y'all jacked up too. <laughs> Did that just free some of y'all up? <laughs> so we learned a little bit about this, the DNA of discipleship from John the Baptist, but learning discipleship from Jesus. Watch this. John has done his job. Verse 35 of chapter 1 of John says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said it again. Look, there's the Lamb of God. That's the one I've been telling you all about. Remember, I'm not the Christ. That's him. It's not about me, so stop following me. You were only following me until he gets there. He's here. See ya. When the two disciples heard him say this, what did they do? They followed Jesus. John the Baptist did something right. Because they, they didn't see Jesus and be like, well, John, man, we, we love you so much. I, we don't want to be, we've been having such a great time with you. Man, can we just stay? No, they, they said, oh, we know exactly who they, that's who you've been telling us about. Thank you, man. And they start following Jesus. But now we're going to learn about discipleship from Christ. Verse 38 says, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what y'all want? It's right there in the scripture. Y'all didn't see that? <laughs> he said, what do you want? It's a great question for a relationship of discipleship. For both. Jesus saw them following him and he said, man, what is it that you want? And isn't this a great question? For somebody to come and say, man, I was just wondering if you could disciple me. Your first question should be, well, what is it that you want? Do you just want to get to know me? Or is it that you want to know Jesus? See, Jesus oftentimes asks these kinds of questions. Now, here is Jesus. We just read in verse 14 that he was the word who became flesh, right? In the beginning was the word, right? He's all, he's all knowing. You think Jesus asked him the question because he didn't know what they wanted? You think? No, he wanted them to think about, why are you coming to follow me? It's a question that many of us need to, to ask. Why are you following Jesus? It's like when we came to him 
He turned and looked and said, what do you want? And if we're honest, some of us will say, I just wanted a husband. I wanted a good job. I want a nice house. I want to get to heaven. I want this. I want that. He wanted to hear, I want you. I just want you. All the other stuff is that, you know, that's, but I want you. And so this morning, the question to you is, why are you following Jesus? Is it to get to heaven? Okay, that's done. Scripture tells me in Ephesians chapter 2 that you're already seated in heavenly places. You're already there. So what, what, is it that, what is it that you want? Jesus is asking right now. And in a discipleship relationship, you've got to ask the question, what do you want? And then ask yourself the question, what do I want as the discipler? What do I want? Again, it takes us back to you've got to know who you are. Because if you're not okay with who you are, again, you're going to be using these people to fill this void that only Christ can fill. Let me disciple five and six of them, because then that makes me feel great. I'm having an impact in people's lives, and that's good. But the reason that you should be doing any of this stuff is so that you may get closer to Christ. That's the purpose of this mentoring religious discipleship relationship on both ends. Are y'all with me? Jesus said, man, what, what, why are you wanting to follow me? What's in it for you? And they respond, I love this. They say, teacher or rabbi, what are you saying? What are you saying? Is that what they said? Isn't it, isn't it interesting that they call him teacher, but they don't ask, what are you saying? They ask, where are you staying? That's interesting, isn't it? Because, see, in discipleship relationships, we're always concerned about, you know, the Bible. Let, let's get some study. We've got to get in the Word, and I, I agree totally with that. But it's interesting that when they ask Jesus, the question, the question was not, what are you saying? I got to hear some word from you, Jesus, because you're the word. And if you, whatever you say is the word. They were like, where are you staying? And here's the, here's the more interesting part. Jesus didn't tell them, well, look, I'm down on the corner of Jerusalem and Bethlehem Street. Uh, I'll look you up tomorrow when I come back. What did he say? He says, come and you will see. In other words, come hang out with me, disciple Come eat with me. Come debate with me. Come experience life's joys and pains with me. In other words, come and do life with me. Now, herein lies what I think is the biggest issue of discipleship slash mentorship in the church is this right here, because we're too busy to have somebody tied to our hip all the time and all of the mess that comes with that person, because we got our own mess. I'm trying to deal with my own mess. I ain't got time to deal with yours and mine, too. Jesus said, man, just, just come hang with me. Learn from me. When engaging in discipleship, you've got to spend time with people. I know you, I, look, I know. I know you're busy. I know you don't have the time. But all of that stuff is selfish. Can we just be honest? It's all selfish. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Like, I got, you know, you got family, you got to take care of kids, you got... You got programs, you got parent teaching me. I get all of that. Yes, we're all super busy. I'm in agreement. But the word says, go and make disciples. I'm not telling you. Jesus said it before he left. 
go and make disciples. So we got to come up with some kind of way to partition some time to tell somebody, come, and you'll see. Some of you all are saying, but I don't want them to see some stuff. That's the reason why I went to John the Baptist first and said, you got to be right with who you are. You see the connection? If, I don't, if I'm not right with who I am in all of my mess, then when I get into this discipleship relationship, it's all about what I can hide. Do y'all, are y'all with me? So when, I, so when I'm discipling somebody and I'm driving down the street and somebody cuts me off, then they're going to see. Pastor Anthony is a little bit perturbed right now. I, I, I just made that a little nicer for the group. I'm not even going to tell y'all what I did last week. I'm not even going to tell you. But look, when, 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 and when I got with the guys that I disciple, like we get together every other Tuesday night at Wingstop. And we just talk and get into the word and talk. And, and, I, had, and I, I confessed to my boys. Y'all, let me tell y'all what I did last week. And guess what that did? That just opened the floodgates. And we spent a whole hour talking about anger. Why? Because I just got real. Because I'm messed up. And I'm okay with that. That's what grace is all about. So Jesus says, come and be, and he does this often. Mark 3, 14, they're up on this mountain, and he calls the 12, and he, 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 he confirms them as apostles. And the very first thing he says is, I want you to be with me, and then I will send you out. He's always talking about being with him. Uh, t- real quickly, turn to Matthew, and I got to finish. Turn to Matthew chapter 11, real quick. It's a very sim- a familiar passage. And sometimes if you're like me, you were like, I don't get that. But Jesus, again, I love seeing him talk to people because he's always telling folk, just come and be with me. Come and see. Come and hang. And he never said, you know, um, next Thursday night at uh, 830, I'm going to be conducting a Bible study on the work. You never see Jesus saying that. What, he, what does he do? He's just kind of hanging out, walking around, and he'll stop, get some fish sandwiches, and start talking. So what is he doing? He's teaching. So while they're with him, they're learning. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't, okay, um, uh, Psalm 91, turn there with me, will you? No, Jesus starts talking, and as he's talking, the word is going forth. I think it's, before we go to Matthew, I think it's interesting that when he says, um, come and you will see, the scripture says that they hung out with him for the rest of the day. It was the 10th hour. Now, some scholars say that's 10 o'clock. Um, some others say it's like 6 in the afternoon. I like the 10 o'clock because it's all day long. Plus, it's in line with Roman time at that time. So they spent all day with the word. <laughs> you imagine spending all day with Jesus. And then they spent the, re- the other three years before he went to the cross just hanging, just doing life with Jesus. Man, I wish, oh, my gosh. So Matthew 11, 28, we all know this verse. Here Jesus is again. He says, come to me. Come. Experience me. Why? Because all of you are weary and burdened. But I'll give you rest, he says. So something happens when we let these folks come into our lives because they begin to see things that maybe they didn't see before and some burdens kind of just fall off. Like, wow, so I don't have to be perfect. So I don't have to keep every one of the Ten Commandments or all 613 of the other laws that I suppose. I don't have to do that because this guy's crazy. But he loves Jesus. Go figure. You can be crazy and love Jesus at the same time. Amen. Some, everybody in here should be like, amen. amen. <laughs> Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What are they weary and burdened from? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Now, anybody ever questioned this verse before? What's a yoke? And it's like, isn't it like a big old piece of wood that they kind of throw in the backs so of these animals and yoke them up with another animal so they can get more power when they're doing their agrarian thing? Isn't that what a yoke is? How's that easy? Anybody ever ask that question? See, that's me. That's my chemistry thing again. I'm always digging like, wait a minute, a yoke is, that's kind of heavy. And how is Jesus, what, he got a little tiny yoke or something? Like, what? Am I the only one when I read scripture, I ask questions like that? All right. <laughs> Listen, in that time, a yoke was equal to the rabbinical teachings. So the teachings of that rabbi is what Jesus is saying. And so what he's saying is, take my rabbinical teachings upon you, the teaching of grace, rather than the rabbinical teachings of the Pharisees, which was law. And under the law, they were burdened because they couldn't keep it. Jesus is saying, just come to me, guys. Just hang out with me, and you'll realize some things. You'll experience my yoke, and it is easy. Some of y'all need to be with Jesus just to experience his yoke. Because you've been yoked up with the pharisaical law stuff for too long now. Hopefully that freed some of you all up. Because this, look, look at what happens. And I'm, I'm getting ready to finish. After Jesus was with them all day, turn back to John 1. See, because if you're... If you're really free, as Jesus just said, take my yoke, and, and you're going to, it's easy, and it's, there's a freedom in that. And he says, if, if, if I'm free, as we just read, if I take on Jesus' yoke, wouldn't you want others to be free as well? See, when you are understanding Jesus like this, like rather than the, the, the 630 13 laws in the word and then all those other laws that you plugged in there too and which is the reason why most people don't come in the building like this because they can't do all of that but if you get freed up like that wouldn't you want to go out and say oh wait a minute oh I've experienced grace like Christ I need to tell you about this I feel like sometimes Christians don't really talk about Jesus because we're still yoked under the pharisaical teachings of the law These brothers spend a day with him, and guess what happens? Andrew, verse 40, Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus and spent the whole day with him. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found grace. Look at that. We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. True discipleship at its core, should lead to the desire and action of bringing people to Christ. Helping them to experience him. Outside of this, the, the list. See, these guys were so freed up, man. They had experienced Jesus, and they had been with him all day. And the very first thing that Andrew did was, I got to go get my brother because this thing right here, this is out of this world. And then later on, Jesus rose up on Philip, says, Philip, follow me. Philip's only with him for a few. And Philip said, where's the Daniel? <laughs> See, when you're experiencing Christ, I mean really experiencing him, you want to tell people. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Did I stop right there? Y'all like, dang, man, shut up. When you experience Christ, you just want to. When you experience his grace and his mercy, you know those new mercies that you received this morning? You know that stuff you did last night? And this morning God said, you're forgiven. Just look, get up, go to church. Come experience me, be with me. Just because of that, you should be running. So, man, let me tell you about Jesus. True discipleship is not interested in the preserv preservation of self. True discipleship is interested in the proclamation of who Christ is. Let's pray.
Father, thank you. Thank you for the DNA of discipleship. God, thank you for John the Baptist's testimony that we're able to read and learn from. Thank you for Jesus' testimony that we're able to read and learn from. Now, Father, as we leave this place, can we leave here ready to do something and not just be encouraged by a message? Lord, help us to be so um, just taken back by the message of grace that we want to go tell somebody about this easy yoke that we've discovered. God, we bless you. Thank you for loving us well in spite of us. Thank you, God. You're good. You're really good. And we bless you today. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.